The market has been a pain to trade this week, but I'm hopeful that after today's volatility, we finally have some cleaner trade ideas that are starting to develop. One thing that we can't lose sight of is the possibility of a daily lower high that could be set. Of course, that's bearish, and we'll talk about it in just a moment. So welcome to the Trade Brigade Midweek Market Update, where we'll build a technical trade plan for Thursday and Friday and take a look through the result of the CPI report. My name is Matt, and if you're new here, hit the thumbs up button and subscribe. For additional resources, check out the links listed down below in the description and stay tuned until the end of today's show. I've got three additional trade ideas to share with you that you won't want to miss. With that said, let's jump right into the charts. So let's kick things off on the SPY daily time frame chart, and a closer look here reveals that the big lower high I was just referring to would be underneath the bottom end of this overhead supply. Now the overall trend here is not bearish. It's actually bullish if we count from the low. This could be a higher low over our key daily line in the sand that we talked about on Saturday at 537. And you'll also notice that the daily structure that's unfolded here is it's very volatile, but nonetheless, it is bullish. So the fact that we're holding this, the fact that we're holding this, the fact that we're well above 537 does lead me to believe that the daily trend is still up. And this is a pullback in the context of a new uptrend that has been found. But I do want us to be somewhat respectful of the 55550 level, noting that we're also extended through the upper bound of this week's expected move. It doesn't mean go out and short this market into oblivion tomorrow because we know, and as we just acknowledged, the trend here is still technically up. It's just a concern I have on the daily time frame. The bottom of overhead supply can now act as resistance. Once again, this big key level is at 555. Aside from that, there's not much to read into here on the daily time frame chart other than the fact that this week has not breached the Friday low of last week. And really, we can get into the nitty gritty on the hourly time frame chart and understand why it's been so painful and why this possibly sets up better opportunities into the end of the week. So Monday opens up smack in the midpoint of the Friday range inside bar is formed and this is the range there on Tuesday things were actually a little bit interesting on the implied gap up the implied gap up meant that any gap fill reversal or price acceptance over the Monday range should have resulted in an opportunity for this into the afternoon obviously that was not the case and the sellers pushed price back into Monday's range so great the next phase, if the market is going to remain bearish, is some sort of hourly lower high to be set back underneath Monday's high and then a rotation into Friday's low. The reason this has been so difficult is because Tuesday actually closed back above Monday's high. And of course, on the daily chart, we just saw this as a hammer candle, right? You can see that for Tuesday right there. So what about the open of today's Wednesday session? Because again, the volatility and the madness doesn't stop there. We open once again over Monday's high. That's this gray dashed line here at 547.50. So first thoughts come right back to mind where, okay, if we can hold up over that level, maybe something like this plays out. Well, the first hourly bar of today's market activity is a straight shot through the low of the Tuesday session, through the low of the Monday session. And you can see we actually breach and we have some price activity underneath 541.50. So great, another opportunity for the sellers to produce some sort of daily lower high up against 549, where you can see we struggled for support once, twice, did the dance around here. Remember that this was also a gap close area. So the opportunity was there. This is now looking like a daily lower high. Into the afternoon, the sellers just had to achieve some sort of lower high intraday underneath 544.85. That was the open of Monday's session. Did that take place? Obviously, we can all see the answer is absolutely not. So the moves that have been happening in this phase of the market right here are, I don't want to call them unbelievable, but they're almost just frustrating, right? Very, very frustrating activity from the market in this box. But now that we have this resolution in the upward direction, I think trade setups are going to start becoming a little bit easier. The market's outside of finally the Friday range. And I think this is where, uh, again, clarity will be offered. So the initial ideas I have because of what we just described out of the daily time frame chart and the threat here for some possible lower high is not to just 
short this instantly, but rather if the market extends over 555.50 and then sets a lower high back down inside of today's Wednesday range, I would entertain shorts here for risk reward that might look like this on a thin structure retracement to come back down and test something like 549. That's looking like a pretty viable trade setup if we see some sort of failure here and a lower high back down inside of the Wednesday range. The sequence there is very specific and we need to see that failure to really uh, indicate that buyers are trapped at terrible location, right? You would not wanna be a new money long trapped here at the highs. This lower high is likely when you're stopping out and that's when we wanna take advantage of a possible pullback. Now, notice the word I just used there, it's pullback in the context of what's starting to become hourly resolution of this as a possible double bottom. So this is now a pullback over the neckline of that double bottom. And if you're saying, Matt, why would I want to short into this massive momentum to the upside? That's fine. The trade for you as a long is looking for two things. Either price acceptance over 555, then tries to get follow through in the upward direction. This to me is a little bit more difficult to participate in just because the market is extended through the upper bound of the weekly expected move. And we don't quite have a reason to trust this level yet for newfound support. If you're entering new money longs up here, yes, your target is here, and yes, you have decent risk reward, but you're sort of chasing it after the move has taken place. So in my opinion, as we were saying, if this failure sort of starts to step up, I would rather look for this double bottom reversal. You could look for an inverted head and shoulders. You could look for a simple hourly hammer candle down here. These things would be interesting on the retest of the daily 50 SMA. That's the blue moving average on your screen. It's the neckline of the double bottom we were just talking about. And it's also turning this level, what was once support, support did the dance around it as we attempted to close the gap on the first go around the opening print basically of the friday session i know it's off by a couple of pennies in there maybe even a dollar if i go out on a limb but that's okay generally a higher low that's set from here to here would then set up better risk reward in my opinion for this trade back in the upward direction. And if we were to subsequently test 555.50 after a higher low from let's say point A to point B, and maybe this sets up into like early next week, right? Then maybe this is more likely to break out on that second test, right? First test, you get the pullback. Second test is the right side of the V, and that's where I'd look for the trend to continue in the upward direction out of the daily time frame chart. So we need to give 555.50 the respect it deserves based on what I can see in front of us right now, as well as some additional indications we'll get to in just a moment. Let's quickly come in here with the intraday anchored view apps, because what you can see is that this is sort of confluence up here for resistance. And if I zoom out, you can see the anchor. It's this Thursday gap up from, you know, who knows however many weeks ago at this point now, but that is confluence at 555.50, reinforcing the idea that any failures up here around that view app should offer the pullback into the retest of 549. And what do we see at 549? You'll also find the view app right there of the original breakdown from Tuesday of last week, right? When the market finally opened up after Labor Day. So 555, 50, 549 top of mind levels here. And in particular, if you're looking for the pullback short, if you're looking for the lower high to be set underneath overhead supply, please be looking for some sort of failure here to really confirm that buyers are trapped with terrible trade location. The next thing we can do is also come in with two Fibonacci perspectives. Firstly, from the low of today's session to the high of today's session, the Fibonacci 38.2 is beautiful, awesome confluence at 549, a must watch level. If we come in from the top of the Tuesday breakdown from last week to Friday's low of last week, what do we see here? The 38.2 has been breached, meaning we've moved above it. This is no longer bearish consolidation down here. And we've also closed today's session over the 61.8. The more times we can spend, the more time that we can spend, excuse me, over the 61.8, the greater the likelihood of a 100% retracement, which of course would imply acceptance over 555.50. So for the most part, FIBS and anchored view apps agree with 549 and 55550. What about the market internals? Let's add, let's add another layer of analysis to this. Uh, if you're not familiar with this dashboard, check out the video tutorial in the top right hand corner. This is where things start to get a little bit wishy-washy. So if we're thinking about how strong the move was in the upward direction, I mean, volume flows, they closed positive after a negative start, but we didn't close up and over 300 million. So not all that great. Net volume flows on the week, as you can see, are here around roughly 215 million. Substantial is over 500 million. And also, if I just quickly remove 
that and focus more so on the breath histogram, what you'll notice is that on the Wednesday morning session here, as the market was breaking down, there was actually much more severe selling pressure getting underneath negative three to one in the morning versus the buying pressure into the afternoon. It was not even able to get up and over positive two to one there. So not the end of the world. I'm not trying to say that these buyers are like full of garbage. Uh, but what I am saying is it wouldn't be unreasonable for that pullback we were just describing. If we look at the advanced decline line, it opened up in trend low or near trend lower zone, excuse me, bounced off of it and only made its way to the zero mark. It did not really accelerate towards trend higher zone today. And if we look at the cumulative build out of the tick, this is where things start to shine a little bit more so. And we can see at the exchange level as the day wore on, we actually got closer to a meaningful read in the upward direction. So I think it's worth respecting the break we've finally seen out of these multiple inside bars out of the Friday range in the upward direction. But a little bit of a pullback here off of that massive overhead supply, I think is a very reasonable outcome as of right now. Another reason why this would be the case is if we take a look at the market profile, which FYI, if you're not familiar with this type of chart, check out the video tutorial in the top right hand corner. If you look at the Friday range, which is really right here, this is Friday session back there. Look at the value area from today's session. It's completely contained still within the Friday range. Now, again, this doesn't mean that the breakout is totally invalidated, but if the market is going to continue in the upward direction, I would really want to see value on tomorrow's Thursday session be found completely outside of Friday's range in the upward direction. So something that we'll check in on and you can follow us over on X and we'll make some posts throughout the day's session. But what I would want to see is the majority of time spent and volume transacted on Thursday over in the ES futures above the level at uh, 5535 roughly, which would be your high of day from the Friday session. We know that we've been using um, uh, to the downside, it's 5440 that we've been leaning on. Uh, to the upside, 5525 has also been a key level coming from these multiple highs in here. So regardless, we want it over Friday's high. That is the most important part. Value needs to progress out of this range if we're going to see progress made in the upward direction and if this is going to be a viable pullback. So just to illustrate what I mean by this, if we just come in here completely, zoom out a little bit. Let's say that this is Friday's high. There's your 5535. Tomorrow, the profile has to look something like this, right? Let's just say that we get a normal day or whatever. Value wants to be up here. If the profile ends up looking like this, so and I know this would be like where Friday is, but if this is the profile, right, and value is down here, this would be an unsuccessful breakout. And I would certainly start targeting the bottom end of the value range, or excuse me, the balance range rather, here at uh, 5410 roughly. All right, so that is your market profile analysis. We need to see progression in the upward direction. Technically speaking, if you want to dive into even more nuances, we do have an M period spike into the end of today's session. So spike rules will be in play for tomorrow. Tomorrow. Let's jump back on over to the platform and move on over to the nasty NASDAQ here. Let's bring it on out to a daily time frame chart. We'll start back over at the QQQ. So overall, in terms of the trend, we know that there's more damage here and it's more susceptible with a weekly lower high that's been set. But just like the S&P 500, you have to give credit where credit is due. Uh, the look below this, is it's, it's starting to turn into a look below and fail, really on the daily higher low line in the sand, which is 458.50. As of Friday's close from last week, we were pretty concerned that, hey, any lower highs set under here would really be detrimental because now we have this is overhead supply, this is overhead supply. This was much more of a meaningful downtrend versus the S&P sideways balance. We had the weekly lower high. So once again, we have to give credit where credit is due. I like the fact that the buyers were able to break out more meaningfully today back up and over 458.50. The issue, just like the S&P, though, is that we have this looming overhead. It's very possible that 468.35 is your next lower high zone. You've got your daily 50 SMA barreling down over here. This could be considered a counter trend move in the context of an existing downtrend here on the daily time frame. So please be mindful of this possible lower high at 468.35. You'll note that the low of today's session was not nearly as close to the Friday low of last week relative to what we saw out of the S&P 500. And if we just knock this down to an hourly time frame chart, there's a couple of other nuances I want to point out here. Notice that Monday, yes, it's inside of the Friday range, but technically on the Tuesday session, we do not make any sort of bar to bar 
equal low or lower low. And there's a much more meaningful higher high as well, uh, more so outside of Monday's range. On the Wednesday session, we actually get an even more constructive gap up, up and over that daily higher low line in the sand at 458.50 as I zoom in a little bit more on that. That's the open of this red bar here. So the morning session out of the NASDAQ is just as volatile and somewhat confusing as the S&P 500. However, the break back above into the afternoon sets up what? Any higher lows above that now start to suggest that you have inverted head and shoulders up and over this would then trigger some sort of uh, avoidance, if you will, of a daily lower high that we were just talking about as a possible threat off of 468.35. So it's the same premise as the S&P 500, but the levels are slightly different relative to previous balance ranges. So what are the ideal outcomes here in the QQQ NASDAQ? In a picture perfect world, you get some sort of look above, fail maybe, and you get consolidation here. This is the difference, the main difference between the S&P and the NASDAQ, where I'd prefer to see these consolidation highs act as support first. If you could get support here off of 464.25, previous resistance, resistance, resistance in here, smashed right through it during today's session. Again, if we had stronger sellers, what should have been the case? Let's play devil's advocate. What should have been the case? A lower high under the daily line in the sand, some sort of rotation like this, a rejection here, and then a close that would have looked like this. Not the case. You can see that we smashed right through it. So stronger sellers have sort of thrown in the towel as of right now. Uh, so going forward, right, this consolidation here is absolutely bullish. This is a trade idea into the end of the week. A brigade bolt higher low over 468.35 gets you the continuation of the counter trend move. And I would start targeting something like 477. Are we extended through the upper bound of the weekly expected move? Absolutely. So you might want to be uh, slightly cautious of this idea here. You would really need to make sure that there's a clean indication of that higher low over today's high. Just like in the S&P 500, this would be the sort of pullback situation I would look for. You could try to short this area for risk reward that looks like this. If you're a believer that the pullback's going to be deeper, you could try to balloon this trade into a full retest of the daily higher low line in the sand. That's 458.50. Honestly, I would actually start to adjust this to today's Wednesday opening print. That number, just as an FYI, is going to be much closer to 460. I'll just round it off there. 460. That would be the ultimate place where I would look to terminate that pullback trade. So in its conclusion, right, this would sort of be what you're looking for. There's 460 risk and reward to the downside if you're trying to play the pullback off of the daily overhead supply. When we get here, just like when we get here, we will be looking for support. So say the pullback comes in, this would start to become a top of mind situation. Where's the double bottom off of 460? Just like the S&P 500, where's the uh, inverted head and shoulders? Where's the hammer candle? Do buyers step up basically over this key level and start to suggest the opportunity for some sort of higher low? Let's quickly check in on the Fibonacci's and the anchored view apps coming in from today's low up to today's high, the 38.2. It's kind of a no man's land, if I'm being honest with you. It's not really confluence with 464.25, nor is it confluence with the daily line in the sand. However, the 61.8 is, which is always the line in the sand pullback, right? So I really like that sort of reinforcement, 458.50 acting as a line in the sand Fibonacci wise as well. And we'll also come in from the top of the move here to the bottom of the move here. 38.2 is confluence with your daily line on the sand, and this 61.8 actually is better confluence with that 464.25. So you are getting a little bit of uh, additional support off of that level, meaning that if you could hold above, the odds should in theory increase for at least a 100% retracement. I would really start targeting that 477 on acceptance over 468.35, as we've already noted. Let's come in with the intraday anchored view apps and see what's going on from this point of view. Rinse and repeat of the S&P 500, basically where this can offer resistance, look above and fail. The pullback totally makes sense. And this is kind of closer to that 460 area we were describing today's opening print rather than the true line in the sand daily level at 458.50. Generally speaking, these ideas are really top of mind into tomorrow. Once again, just to be, you know, really comprehensive here, this pullback stop number one, let's say, uh, we'll look for a reversal off of that. If we get continuation, we're certainly looking about something around 460, looking for reversals off of that level in here, and then retracements back up to the equal high, if not breakouts for follow through into 477. That's what we've got in the up and downward direction in the immediate term. Obviously, if there's going to be much more bearish activity, let's just blanket statement this. If there is going to be much more bearish activity, you would need to see price acceptance out of the NASDAQ underneath 
for 58.50. If something like this takes place with a lower high, duck and cover. This is a lower high on the daily time frame chart. This is an executable lower high on the hourly time frame chart. We're looking for a continuation move in the downward direction. That's where things start to get much more nasty. However, based on the momentum to the upside, I'm much more willing to entertain what we've already described here and what we've already described here. Let's jump on over to the internals for the NASDAQ side of things and see what's going on from this point of view. We can see a rinse and repeat. Actually, not so much. I take that back. Maybe jump in the gun there a little bit on my side. Uh, notice that the NASDAQ volume flows actually were much closer to substantial here, near 400 million, but not breaching in the upward direction. You're still getting the similar indications out of the advanced decline line, making a move over the zero mark, but hardly getting anywhere close to substantial reads in trend higher zone. And your cumulative build out of the NASDAQ is much more muted versus the S&P 500. So some really conflicting indications here with volume checking out, but advanced decliner and tick not really supporting much of the bullish continuation that you saw in the upward direction. Let's finish it up on the NASDAQ with the market profile, the NQ futures over yonder. Let's see what we can see. And we'll do the same sort of approach where where did we end up with value relative to Friday's range of last week? Here is Friday highlighted in white, and here is today's value area on today's NQ futures right around in there. So we made some progress outside of Friday's range, but not a ton. You can clearly see the point of control is contained in there as well. Going forward, I would want to see value tomorrow over 19,000 in the NQ futures. If value can progress to something that looks like this, that would be a strong step for the buyers to really initiate a stronger counter trend move on the daily chart, which tries to reverse the trend in the upward direction, right? Because we know if we just quickly go back to the daily chart, right? This is a short term downtrend. You have highs, lower highs, lows, lower lows have been brought in. You did not hold that key level that we've already described in such detail. Let's move along to the IWM and see what's going on with the small cap side of the market. Small caps now are lagging the move. I mean, if you just look at the market minder window, this is the beauty of having the percent change from the open script. Uh, only up only air quotes, 70 basis points versus the Nasdaq up 189 basis points and the S&P up 104 basis points. So it's definitely the laggard of the bunch. It did still put in a decent reversal off of the lows here, but you'll notice a couple of things on the bar to bar count as I just zoom in a little bit further. Notice that every single low this week has been a lower low and you did not breach over Monday's high. You've barely closed right at the Tuesday high. So it leaves a little bit to be desired. I also want to point out that you're still caught between a rock and a hard place. This could be your hard place and this could be your rock overhead. I mean, it doesn't look good, to be honest with you, uh, still out of small caps. Even if this does produce a counter trend rally into something like 215, the opportunity for a lower high there is certainly something we need to respect. And if it rejects and falls underneath the weekly line in the sand at 207.80, Start becomes a little bit more concerning on that R word, of course, recession out of small caps. The only saving grace here is if you look at something like the KRE, which we've been using as a proxy for, of course, obviously regional banks, but they have a lot of exposure to commercial real estate, which is sensitive to interest rates, of course. I do like that previous resistance is still trying to act as support here. I would argue that you're still stuck between kind of a rock and a hard place where you have this overhead supply here out of the KRE, but at least this is not like you know, at least there's not an exaggerated reaction out of regionals where you're already underneath 53, suggesting some kind of reversal to the downside, right? So that's maybe a small saving grace, but not something to lean on too, too much here. As we consider back to the IWM daily structure, we do have a hammer candle sweeping under the low, sellers failing to find acceptance underneath that weekly line in the sand. So any sort of breaks over 210 into the end of the week, you could see a counter trend move develop into 215. And let's think about what that means for the broad market as a whole, right? That probably means a little bit of upward pressure for your S&P 500. So watching that quite closely into the Thursday and Friday session with PPI tomorrow morning at 830, we know that the IWM should be slightly more sensitive to that economic news. We'll see if it can send it up and over that 210 level. Let's jump on down to the hour early time frame chart, see what else we can learn about the price action over here. The textbook pattern that would basically unfold if this were to be the case over 210, of course, is your inverted head and shoulders. So if we can spot higher lows over 207.80, keep eyes on that 210 for that possible break and counter trend move to unfold. If you find that the IWM is trading underneath 207.80, which basically is the opening print of today's session, 
I would say, okay, dialing back expectations that we're going to have any sort of bullish tailwind for the S&P 500. It just won't be the case if the IWM is sub 207.80. We can quickly check in on the anchored view apps here out of small caps. Notice that we have not recaptured any of them. There is no, you know, there's nothing here, basically. I would say that maybe you could get the break and rotate from, let's say, cluster A to cluster B up here. It's not really a cluster. It's a single. At 215, you get the idea. It just reinforces the trade plan that we've just described. Let's come in with a Fibonacci from the top of the Tuesday breakdown from last week into the bottom of the move so far. 38.2 is technically suggesting that this is just bearish consolidation down here as long as we're under that 210 level. And the 61.8, although not perfect confluence with 215, it is just vaguely suggestive of like, you know, be careful of resistance up here. It's a great place. It's a reasonable place, really, for a lower high to be set on the IWM. Let's jump on over to the Russell internals and see what's going on from this perspective. And as we can see over here, you did not have even close to substantial volume inflows. You only made it back to sub-zero out of the advanced decline line and the cumulative build on the tick, although positive, not substantial, closing out around 1,700 in the upward direction. So still a little bit to be desired on the bull side out of the Rusty Russell. Let's jump into the RTY futures through the lens of market profile and see what else we can learn here. I think this reinforces the possible breakout over the, it's, it's really a mechanical level at this point. I would say this zone right here. Notice today's high of day, the value area high from Monday, the high of day from Tuesday. If you can clear this, and this is exactly what we were talking about at 210 out of the IWM cash side of the market, if you can clear it, you do have a thin structure retracement to make into the high of the Friday session, if not slightly higher, into, as we know, 2180 is the big level out of your Russell futures. That's the equivalent of, if we just go back on over here, your 215 big overhead area of resistance. That is the small caps breakdown. Let's take a look quickly through through the S&P sectors and see what else we can learn in terms of supporting evidence. First and foremost, what is the weekly performance of the sectors? Who was leading, leading who was losing, and where was the weight? We have semiconductors on one heck of a rebound here, up 6.84% on the week, followed by the tech sector up 5.37% on the week, and then real estate up 2.7%. At the bottom of the barrel, the laggards are energy. We'll take a look at crude because it continues to not look so good there in terms of global growth. It certainly looks like things are slowing down. Down. We have financials lagging down 0.96%, mainly on the JP Morgan panic from the Tuesday session. And then the XLP is a laggard as well, down 0.2% on the week. Generally speaking, this is more of a risk on style look as this reversal is underway. I would be much more concerned about this attempted move in the upward direction if this was completely inverse. If energy was leading the pack, if we had consumer staples leading the pack, if we had materials, real estate, and maybe even healthcare up towards the top if utilities were much further up the list here, I'd be concerned. But noting that this rebound is being driven by the heavyweight sectors, or at least the more influential sectors over the market, that to me is, I don't want to say fully reassuring, because once again, I do want you to respect 555 for what it's worth. Um, but it is a better look compared to what could have been worse. Let's check in on the actual structural charts here and see what's going on. And I think what we'll find is like, Mm, even in some of these important heavy hitters, there's still opportunities for lower highs. So notice out of the SMH, we've been talking about like, hey, maybe it's a man ray pattern with your right shoulder developing. You could find like a sub right shoulder here underneath this 237. Yes, there's a strong reversal underway off of the daily 200 SMA. But if this just stuffs up against 237 and rolls back over, you're going to be hard pressed to find continuation out of your S&P 500. So that's a top watch into the end of this week. The most bullish outcome here would be some sort of breakout on Thursday over that level. And then some sort of like mild, mild consolidation or mild pullback into that 237, setting up possible continuation in the upward direction to negate this as a right shoulder of that major pattern we were just describing. So 237, top watch out of the SMH. If there's a large reversal, let's just say that we completely wipe out any of the gains from today's session and close Thursday back down under the opening print down towards this 200 SMA. I mean, how could it not just be lower high, lower high, right? So you have to you know, take this chart at face value. Although it was a strong update, although the week looks good so far, the trend is not technically out of the woods here. Let's move along to the technology sector where it's going to be a rinse and repeat, basically. But your level to watch is at 218. You've got your daily 50 SMA here. We have highs. 
lower highs, possible lower highs. We can't confirm it yet. Obviously, there's no indication of sellers stepping up yet, and we know that there is a strong momentum moving in the upward direction. But if this struggles and pulls back, now you're starting to deal with range compression, something that looks like this, and we're just really going to have to wait until you either breach this for a higher low or if you come down here and breach this for a lower high. That's really your top watch out of the XLK. So 218 and 205.25. Next up, we've got real estate lightweight sector continuing to push in the upward direction as interest rates come down. Not a shocker here. Not really that concerned. Upward pressures, upward pressure. Let's move along to the XLY, which is definitely more of a heavyweight risk on indication. Here's a balance range starting to break in the upward direction. Notice the close over 188.75. Ideally, this sees continuation into the 193.50, and that would be a range double. So a very classic technical pattern there. And of course, any sort of attempt up to this level would be bullish for your S&P 500. So even if tech doesn't do it, if discretionary can do it up and over 188.75, great. Maybe that continues to keep the S&P 500 afloat, even if the Russell is sort of struggling as we navigate these recession concerns. Let's move along to utilities, the most bond-like sector pressing up into those all-time highs. And a breakout here should technically be upward pressure for the S&Ps, but we don't want it to be the only thing continuing in the upward direction if the market is trying to continue its move as well. Next up, we've got the TLT just to check in. No shocks over here with rates continuing to move lower, seeing bonds continue to push in the upward direction. That's fine. If we look at the XLI, decent little uh, test of the 50 SMA. What I like mostly about this chart is that there was a strong opportunity for a weekly higher low, at least from here to here after pulling back from a brand new all time high, as we conceded in the weekend update. I mean, it would have been ideal if, if something like this happened, of course, but this is still OK here out of the XLI for a weekly higher low. So all set as long as we're over 126. Ideally, we just work our way back up towards the all time high for upward pressure. Consolidation in here is OK. I would be more concerned on a breakdown under 126. Next up, materials. Lightweight sector, not all that meaningful for the market. Midpoint of its balance range, nothing to see here. XLV, healthcare sector, third heaviest weight sector by market cap. I like the higher low. I like the consolidation in here. The most important takeaway of the daily bar, honestly, is the fact that we swept these lows and we had thin structure. I mean, it would have been fine to see a weekly pullback into this fat, flat top breakout area. Maybe we can call it a fat top breakout area, but Flat top breakout area, daily 50 SMA, a weekly higher low would have been fine here. But notice the close back over the level. Pretty strong display of strength uh, from XLV. Any rotations back towards the all-time high after this failure from the sellers would correlate to bullish pressure in the S&P 500. Next up, we've got communications, sort of more similar to materials, honestly. The only difference is that communications, unfortunately, are a heavier weight sector. They're not a top four, but they are heavier weight uh, compared to materials, and they're much more risk on. So being in the midpoint of the range, not really a warm and fuzzy feeling. We know that the big culprit here is just the staggering relative weakness out of Google primarily. So that's a concern. Ideally, we get in this upper third and start to attempt new all-time highs, but taking it at face value, just kind of neutral for the S&P 500. Energy breaking down, falling off of a cliff, and we know that this is mostly tied to the weakness we see over in crude. Crude making new lows underneath. These are new 52-week lows. This is, again, starting to fall more into the recessionary theme category, as we were describing over in the IWM. So as global, global growth possibly slows down, any acceptance underneath, like what is this prior low, loosely like 69 um, any acceptance below that is like, wow, really starting to have more concerns about global GDP, you know, slowing down, possibly working our way into a stagflation environment here. So uh, and we'll talk more about the CPI report, which, in my opinion, really wasn't that great. Uh, we'll get into that in just a moment. So that's energy and crude. Let's jump into the XLF financials, just like the XLV, honestly, a strong display of strength looking underneath a previous flat top or fat top as we uh, misspoke just a moment ago at 44. So I like the close back above. And if this wants to stay above 44, maybe there's an opportunity to get back in the upward direction off of something like a weekly higher low. That's also respectful of your daily 50 SMA, the blue moving average on your screen. So 44 will continue to be a top watch here. If we're above it, it's hard to say anything bearish for the S&P 500. If we're underneath like instantly on the Thursday session, accepting here and maybe on Friday, we get some like lower high indication underneath 44. Yeah, I'd start to become more concerned. Failed breakout here, starting to look like acceptance back underneath that breakout level. You know, second heaviest weight for the S&P 500. 
not really the greatest look. So 44 top pivot, so far so good with the daily. You could call it a gravestone doji. You could call it a dragonfly doji, whatever you want to call it there. Looks okay with the close back above 44 is the main point. Next up, we've got the XLP consumer staples trading near all time highs. It is D for defensive. So, you know, keep that in the back of your mind when you're looking at it. But generally speaking, the chart looks fine. Clear uptrend breaking out over this flat top plenty of room for a weekly higher low ideally daily consolidation happens here and upward pressure remains upward pressure if we break into blue sky territories let's jump on into the ratio grid and see what we can learn over here if you're not familiar with how to set this one up in thinkorswim check out the video tutorial in the top right hand corner i like the rebound out of the xlk but this goes back to the whole concept of what we were talking about on the structural chart is it possible that you just set some kind of lower high here if there's a reversal into the end of the week Absolutely. So I don't think we're out of the woods. I think if you do something that looks like this, you can see it's very nuanced, but it is there. There's a lower low on the chart. So coming from the lower low means that we can afford a lower high. And this is really a counter trend move in the context of an existing downtrend. Uh, we just don't want to lose sight of these things, right? I think that there are still plenty of risks that might not make it the easiest reversal back in the upward direction for the S&P 500 as a whole. Healthcare is D for defensive. It's in much more of a clear uptrend there. So take that for what it's worth. XLF has pulled back aggressively, but I like the opportunity for a higher low. If we look at the XLY, it's trying to trade back towards the top end of this range over here. It would be more constructive if it could make a higher high. We talked about where that ideal consolidation is out of the structural chart. So we'll be watching for that. Generally speaking, in the top four heaviest weight sectors in the S&P 500, I'm getting a little bit of mixed reads here, considering all of the different directions that these are pointing and trending, noting that the XLV is ultimately D for defensive. If we look at the risk off sectors then, which are going to be your XLP and your XLU down here, I mean, these have just made higher highs technically, right? You can see from here to here, higher high, not necessarily in the XLU, more of an equal high, but is it possible that they set higher lows? Are they ultimately in uptrends is a question to ask and answer. And the answer is yes, they are in uptrends. They can set higher lows. I don't think we're fully out of the woods here for like an, oh my goodness, here come brand new all-time highs from a sector posture perspective. Let's jump into some specialized ratios, which will really reveal a lot of the same here. If we look at the SHY XLK, a nice counter trend move, but you're really in a phase of range compression with higher lows and lower highs. I would be much more excited about being long the market if we made a new swing high. Similar concept over here, XLU XLK. If we turned this into a double bottom, great. That's much more constructive as of right now still too much of a threat of a lower high so that's not risk on as we look at the xly over the xlp so you know apples to apples comparison sort of over here that's looking better uh, we're over the 2.23 and ideally some sort of equal high breakout here triggers a double bottom at least to the top end of the range that would feel a little bit more risk on but that's only one out of the three we've looked at so far and finally we've got ourselves the smh over the xlv which you can see still has the opportunity for a lower high after making a lower low so really only one one of the four specialized ratios is getting close to saying neutral to risk on all the other ones are still either neutral or actually bearish as we take a look at the usd jpy this is coming back into view as we make new closing lows underneath the august 5th panic the reason that this is not really a big deal for the market right now in my opinion is because the nikkei as we go over to this chart over here if i could get the right numbers 225 not 255 it's because this has not triggered a move underneath this sort of flat top breakout area if we just flip this to a candlestick chart you'll see that as clear as day here we go so flat top breakout as we got the rebound you'll notice that we have a couple of wicks down here suggesting that buyers are trying to step up you'll even see i've got an alert i think we did this live on either the morning prep or in saturday update video one or the other is as long as this is above i don't think that the yen carry trade is as much of an issue if the japanese market actually starts making new lows if it's trading near these lows from august 5th that's where i think you have more of that unwinding and fear about global markets kind of you know unraveling if you will so that's that chart there let's jump in to the dollar and see what's going on from this perspective you can see it's really stable down here on the lows as interest rates really haven't done much the interest rate volatility has slowed down just a little bit so let's take a look before we go to interest rates let's follow it up with gold we haven't checked in on gold in a little while we did talk about it in the pre-market prep the other day at the request of 
I'm going to blank on the name, but uh, we'll get you next time. So this breakout in here, that would be more of a risk off signal. But what has the market done out of gold? It's really just more so stagnant than anything else expressed as a currency relative to the dollar. It's making total sense what the Dixie chart is actually doing. Now let's jump into the TNX and see what's going on with interest rates. So continuing to drift in the downward direction, but not so much volatility compared to the August 5th breakdown. And remember, it's the interest rate volatility. It's the massive uncertainty with policy that really causes the market to freak out and be like, wow, like we should panic and sell everything and, you know, let's wait for some more clarity. So the fact that this is a much more controlled move in the downward direction makes more sense to me here as to why the market can possibly see some positive reactions. If we look at what's going on with the inverted ZT, which is basically the Fed tracker tool through the two year bond, uh, it's continuing to drift in the downward direction. But once again, you're not seeing as much volatility here. And as we know, the tracker tool is currently pricing in higher odds of the 25 basis point cut, which in my opinion, is the proper policy move here, if anything at all, right? You really don't want to see, in my humble opinion, who am I to say, but, you know, based on what I can see, I don't think it makes sense for a double cut. So as of right now, the latest refresh was just a minute ago uh, as I fired up this dashboard for the show here. But, you know, we're getting 85% odds of a single 25 basis point cut, which, again, in my opinion, is the proper approach. This would be a total policy misstep in, again, my humble opinion. Who am I to tell Jerome Powell what to do? But a double cut would start to signal like, wow, we think we're way behind the curve. And also we're confident on the inflation battle. And let's talk about inflation because this morning CPI print was just in my opinion, horrendous. It was not at all what I think the market wanted to see. Now, obviously, we rallied after a morning route to the downside, but at first glance, it's like, okay, good. I mean, you saw a big contraction here on the year over year number. This is the non core version. It's down to 2.5 after a 2.9 prior. Uh, you can see the month over month non core hit the expectations and the prior at 0.2. But if you actually look at core CPI, this is not really doing anything that I think is helpful for the Fed. I mean, it came in hot on the month over month at a point three. If we just quickly flip over to here, you can see on the core year over year, it's it's unchanged. It's at a 3.2. And the actual breakdown of the report, which we did live on air this morning, right, as it came out, this is like my largest gripe with the CPI report right here. Services, less energy services. We know energy is massively volatile. It was down like, you know, let's just flip up to the top real quick. Energy inflation was down month over month here. And if I just scroll up, this is the August report. So we're all on the same page. I'm not hiding any columns. There's no gotchas over here. This is energy down 0.8% month over month. The annualized read is down 4%. That's massive. We know energy is volatile. No shockers there. If you look at food, which is also typically volatile, 0.1 and 2.1 on the annualized. Fine. No big deals out of that. But look at services. Less energy, sir. I mean, just these numbers are not at all, in my opinion, in alignment with a Fed that should be confident about inflation going back to 2% in like the blink of an eye. I mean, this was like a good, great first step. The June report where we got a 0.4 to a 0.2. We wanted to see more 0.2s out of shelter primarily. It doubled on the very next read to July. And now we're even, a, you know, 10 basis points higher than that in the month of August. The annualized read 5.2%. So in an economy which is driven by consumers, right, two thirds of the economy is consumer spend. How like there's not going to be. How do you phrase it? You know, everyone's worried about consumer spending. Everybody's worried about recession. Everybody's worried about growth. If consumers drive that growth and a huge chunk of their income has to go to rent or owner's equivalent rent mortgages or whatnot, you're not going to have that booming economy where everything's plentiful and people feel good about inflation. So the whole concept of the Fed being very confident about inflation moving to 2%, I'm not seeing it when this read is at a 0.5%. I mean, even if you look at something like transportation services at a 0.9, I wouldn't say it's nearly as important as shelter, but still very elevated. If you look at the annualized read, it's at a 7.9, my goodness. And even medical care services, again, maybe not as important as shelter. Shelter is something that everybody gets hit with every month, huge portion of your capital outlay, right? Uh, but only down 0.1 basis point and the annualized at a 3.2. So I'm, I'm just not seeing the story there. And again, the whole reason I bring this up is to stay on top of what the Fed tracker tool should and shouldn't do if Jerome Powell is going to appropriately land this plane as a soft landing without reigniting inflation. So a double cut here would be a huge policy mistake based on what we've just talked about. As we take a look at, uh, let's take a look at some breakdowns here, courtesy of the terminal. What do we see? This is your 
rent of shelter, so the rent segment broken down, I mean, just look at the month over month acceleration back in the upward direction. It, I, again, it, it, it's, it boggles my mind that there have been comments made that, okay, the lag impacts are going to send inflation back down to you know 2% within the blink of an eye. Maybe if this trajectory held up and we started getting like, you know, 0.1, 0, negative, but absolutely not the case. And you can see it's not even that it's just like rent of primary residence here in green, right? It's actually the owner's equivalent rent, right? So mortgages are higher here. And the whole point of raising interest rates, right, was to bring down the cost of housing by increasing the cost of financing, right? It's just not playing out at all. The, the lag impacts, like, great, there were some impacts, but it's not sticking. You're sort of stabilizing here at this uh, elevated read, 0.4s, 0.5s, not, not at all uh, projecting a 0.2. So that's my take there. Um, again, a little bit subjective on the fundamental breakdowns, but that's just what I'm seeing based on the data. Here are more contributions. This is the year-over-year non-core. So keep in mind, this is non-core. That's why it includes this uh, purple segment here. This is goods inflation during the sickness rebound, if you will. We can see that goods inflation is like a non-issue. We've got that well under control. Look at green. Green represents shelter's contribution. Look at where it was previously. Uh, so we've got a lot of work to do if shelter is going to bring CPI as a whole down to the Fed's target at 2%. Let's quickly take a look at earnings. It's all about Adobe after the close tomorrow. There's really nothing going on here today. We know that GameStop was a popcorn move and Oracle had a decent little gap up there. So Adobe, that's your next AI play to watch from an earnings perspective. And with that, we'll get back on over to the platform, finish up today's analysis with the additional supporting evidence, then the core list of companies, and then I've got three trade ideas for you. So we're going to begin back here with the TLT relative to the S&P, just because notice that this has started to roll over a little bit as the S&P has tried to make this move back in the upward direction, but the higher low phenomenon is still there. And my biggest watch here, my biggest fear really, if the market's going to slip further into a risk off mentality is if we make a new swing high over this level. As a matter of fact, let's just come in here together and mark this off. That way we're all on the same page, 0.19. I'm not going to adjust it because sometimes these fractions get finicky. I know we typically like round numbers, but we can't afford to really do that here on a ratio. So 0.19, if we're over it, oof, start to look out below. Not really a great risk on indication. As we look at bonds relative to themselves, they are trending in the downward direction across all durations, which would be a bullish indication for risk assets down below, such as equities. Let's take a look at credit spreads, which started to reaccelerate in here, but are starting to flatline a little bit. As long as we don't make aggressive moves in the upward direction, as long as there's some sort of indication that a lower high can be uh, set here, I would be okay out of credit spreads. And the main reason behind that is if we take a look at junk bonds, notice that they still remain in sort of a positive divergence, where a bullish positive divergence, right? Trading at these equal highs where the S&P 500 is still technically at a lower high underneath its balance range over here. And we can see the same exact thing on the LQD, if you don't want to use junk and you want to use something a little bit, uh, you know, more reserved corporate grade bonds, right? Uh, this has certainly already made a higher high over the top of that range. So still seeing positive divergence out of the bond market here, which is bullish for the underlying. Uh, let's take a look at the Bitcoin chart. It's really stagnating. The fact that it's not accelerating here to me is like, okay, but I'd prefer if this is going to act like a total risk on indication, I'd prefer the brigade bolt right into the top end of the range. We're just not getting that yet. We're still underneath that. Let's just call it 61,000 uh, for round numbers sake. Let's move along to the total breadth of the market and see what's going on. Moving average charts, trying to make an uptick here, looking at new highs versus lows, trying to make an uptick, but nothing substantial. Remember that the biggest issues out of the breadth chart would be if these flip below 50% and if this gets negative under zero. And we haven't gotten that yet during the pullback that we saw with the breakdown during last week and even the volatility from this morning session. It's not like we had some big flash underneath the zero line in here. This is also reflected in the RSP equal weight S&P 500 right back butted up against its big fat top. That's going to be the joke of the day now. Uh, flat top rejection here at 172.50. If we can get above that, I would tend to start thinking more so about price acceptance from the S&P 500 inside of the overhead balance range instead of rejecting it. Just noting that this, right, look at, look at this relationship here, 
versus this relationship here. So any acceptance up here to me would indicate that we should at least get here, if not attempt some sort of break for brand new all time highs. So breath is technically still bullish here. Um, and I would be even more bullish on breath if we could get over 172.50. Let's jump on into the QQQE and not much to describe over here. You're still basically uh, offering the same exact look out of the equal weight NASDAQ. Nothing to really write home about the Dow Jones industrials just because we haven't checked in in a while. New highs over here, pulling back, trying for a higher low. Transports still in the midpoint of the range, not really confirming that it's a total risk on move yet. Let's check in on volatility. VIX is still elevated but pulling back underneath 2050. So I would tend to start thinking about 15 uh, with CPI in the rear view mirror. I think that this has the chance to stay elevated over 15, uh, but to get there would certainly mean that the market could see a continuation move in the upward direction. Matt, why would you say it's going to stay over 15? Simply because we have the FOMC decision next week. So watching out for that quite closely, I think market participants are still going to have a big argument back and forth. Should it be a single cut, a double cut, whatever? I think it's going to keep volatility elevated personally. As we take a look at VVIX, VVIX is still elevated as it rightfully should be considering all of the things we've talked about fundamentally. And if we look at the volatility futures, this is actually a little bit more helpful seeing these things work their way back into a stronger contango. If money managers are going to allocate capital, we want more risk in an unknown future instead of backwardation where there's more risk in the present day and less risk in the future. The one thing to keep tabs on is going to be our VIX one day where we've got consolidation up here. We really want to see that underneath 1275 if you're going to get a more substantial sort of settling down in volatility out of the market. So watching that, let's jump on into the core list of companies and finish up today's episode of the midweek market update. Apple kicks things off here and I've got some ideas on Apple. Uh, about this balance range. It's been a really sloppy move down towards these lows. Market participants couldn't really accelerate underneath the bottom of that area. So as we move on down to the hourly, perhaps that gets a little bit more clear. Notice the breakdowns earlier on in the week. Here's the Apple event. Here's sort of the end of day. Here's Tuesday morning. Here's even the sort of mid morning session from today. There's not a lot of sell side acceptance underneath 218.50. So watching this going forward, I would really love to see something that looks like this to get us a brigade bolt over 222.50 into 225.15. And then like, yes, the major pattern would turn into some sort of double bottom. We're just not there yet. I would prefer to see this as a trade into the end of this week. Any consolidation in between these two levels really leaves a lot to be desired. Be my guest if you want to get chopped up in here, but I'm just going to be patient. Uh, for a big short, it would require something that looks underneath 218.50 with a confirmed lower high to test the breakout point from back here. Remember, one, two, three equal highs at 214. Next up, we've got Microsoft. What's going on with Softy? Much more of a firm rotation in the upward direction, breaking the daily downtrend. We had a resistance trend line here. It's where we topped out on on the Tuesday session, and you can clearly see the move above that. Now we are coming into the equal high from this previous pivot, and we do have the daily 50 SMA as confluence there for potential resistance. So as we take a look at the hourly time frame chart for possibilities, what would we be on the lookout for? Well, any continuation, just like the broad market, really, this is a reasonable pullback to short risk and reward in the downward direction. If you're more of a bull looking to play the continuation in the upward direction and a break of this pivot high from back here, what you would probably be looking for is instead, let the pullback do its thing and try to long this, right? Previous resistance, resistance trying to act as support off of 419.75. I would not call it the end of the world if Microsoft even pulls back further than that and tries to support over the top of the two-day highs one and it's really two from the morning session of today at 41525. If you can support off of that, that would be the line in the sand I use looking for some kind of hourly higher low. If you're underneath 41525, I think you're much more so in some sort of uh, daily range compression where you get this and you know you'd be trading at this point at, at, at that point, too many points. Uh, you'd be trading in this zone at that stage and you're really stuck between you know a range at that point. You have a higher low, lower ish kind of high trading in the midpoint kind of sloppy you can see there's not much price clarity in that zone around 413 so that is microsoft next up is nvidia the one stock to rule them all after a nasty fake out this morning the chart actually did play out as we had sort of posted over on x if you're not following us there you should be uh, but this inverted head and shoulders played directly through the thin structure into 
our rejection zone overhead. So 115.75 is important because on the daily time frame chart, we know it is the monster neckline of the double top from over here. It is all of the equal highs that acted as resistance. It is the two-day lows before the large breakdown into the end, or I should even say just the beginning of last week. That was Tuesday of last week. It's the daily 50 SMA. So I think now is a time to be slightly cautious of NVIDIA. The move really was on today's session, this was the trade to be looking for. And now it's like, okay, let's reevaluate inside of this range overhead. So honestly, I would tend to think a pullback here is not unreasonable. The next ideal higher low would be over 109.50. A subsequent test of this would then set up the right side of the V to go through and start a more constructive daily uptrend. If this were to fail back down under 109.50, it's nothing more than a daily lower high here off of the 50 SMA. And then you get a massive flush under 103.50, sorry, 103.75 into something like your 98.75 and even 92. If we go back to the daily time frame chart, the August 5th breakdown low. Daily 200 SMA would meet us there over time. And again, that's a stretch. I'm not calling for that tomorrow or even the next day. I'm talking about the what ifs if this sets a big time daily lower high up against 118, 115.75. Next up, we've got Google. Let's see what's going on over here. I think Google's starting to show some signs of exhaustion. It made a very clean level to level move on Friday of last week. It's sort of, you know, it got some follow through on Monday, but now it's sort of stopping that follow through, if you will. It's slowing down. You've got two equal highs at 150, 150. You've got a daily hammer candle that looked underneath the previous day's low, closed at the highs. Anything that looks like this is a thin structure retracement. Here it is on the hourly time frame chart. What we would be looking for is some kind of double bottom brigade bolt above the neckline, and we are targeting 156.50 on the possible upswing. If it's just consolidating down here, let's call it for what it is. It's just a bear flag at that point. So 151.50, major pivot point here out of Google. Next up, we've got Amazon Nancy. Let's see on the daily time frame chart, resolving this balance range in the upward direction. I like the support from the lower wick of today's session. And more importantly, I like the stronger close outside of and above this previous pivot high. If this can get acceptance anywhere over 181.50, I would still give it room down to 178.50, to be honest with you. If we could support over this area, I think that there's a good chance we come at least into these equal highs because there's really thin structure on the breakdown from that bar back here. That level would be 189.50 as a potential target. Here it is on the hourly time frame chart. You can see the thin structure from the vertical breakdown back here. And walking forward, right, the idea would just be consolidation, bullish, risk here, reward up towards that level. You could look for brigade bolts over today's high of day. And in this case, it would be risk here, reward here into that same exact level. If you pull back deeper and start to suggest something that looks like this, maybe it's a double bottom and you get one, two, and your neckline is back over 180, right? So there's a number of different ways that this can play out, but I am bullish on the resolution of this balance range in the upward direction and making a new pivot high from point A back here to point B, the high of today's session. Next up, we've got the metaverse. What's going on with Zuckerberg and the fantasy land? This is turning into a range here, and I would be respectful of a minor level out of meta, which is 508. 508, you can see there was not a lot of acceptance above that on the Tuesday morning session. It was the open of today's session. So any consolidation here is a good first step, but I wouldn't really be bullish on meta until we're over 514.75 for something that looks like this, thin structure retracement from the Friday session of last week. If you're consolidating here and you get a brigade bolt lower high under 508.50, you could look for the bottom end of the range. My only reservation about that particular trade is that you're entering in the midpoint. What do we say? Don't exchange in the range. Don't enter in the center. Don't diddle in the middle. So that's metaverse. Next up is Tesla. What's going on with Mr. Musk and the rocket ship? I love the 226 level here. I like the constructive sort of stair step that was built in the upward direction. I would love to see previous resistance. Resistance act as newfound support. So tests and higher lows into the top end of the Friday, basically opening print and high of day at 234.15. That's also an overhead gap. It closes up at 246.25. So watching for the market to put in bullish consolidation here or any sort of buy setups over 226 to get that rotation. And then we'll monitor for continuation. If we fail back down under 226, you could take a look above and fail, but I would really want to see specifically out of this chart and the confluence with the broad market, I would want to see broad based weakness in the S&P and the NASDAQ if you're looking for something that does this and a rotation to come back down into these lows at 219. 
you would need to see broad market weakness if this is going to be an attractive setup for risk reward that possibly presents itself along those lines right there. Next up, we've got JP Morgan. This is the one that got absolutely hammered by what was going on on the Tuesday session. There was some commentary from Mr. Demon himself, a couple of the you know presidents or whatever of the company. Generally speaking, they offered some pretty soft guidance going forward for Q3, trying to set the stage there. And this offered some of the pullback in the XLF sector that we were just looking at. But look at the glaring relative weakness underneath one, two, three areas of resistance, whereas the XLF as a sector actually closed above that level. Remember, it was 44 over on the XLF. So seeing this weakness is somewhat of a concern. This is just an inside bar consolidation in the lower 50% of the range. It is a hammer technically. Uh, so the long lower wick does mean that buyers stepped up. But would I be bullish here trying to trade JP Morgan in the midpoint of the range? Probably not. Probably not. I would say, if anything, there might be a thin structure retracement. Maybe this is double bottom. So any acceptance over 206.25 is fairly interesting to like 213. Here's your thin structure. Maybe that plays, but on you know for something, for something at this price point, just look at Tesla. I, I would much prefer to trade Tesla, which has a higher probability. I would say, uh, or an easier time rather, because it's so, so high beta to the market, trading a similar range. Right? We're talking about you know let's just call it shy of 10 points or whatever. If you look at Tesla. I mean, this move here from 226 to 234, also just shy of 10 points, but it looks much more reasonable, right? It wouldn't be unreasonable for Tesla to do something exactly like that. So anyways, that's Tesla, that's volatility, that's JP Morgan. Let's take a look at Netflix. Let's go out to a daily time frame chart, trying to get a bull flag look still off of this daily move over here. I like the hammer. I like the support off of the daily 50 SMA. I like the support off of this level, but the long's not clear yet until we're over 685. Here we go to an hourly time frame chart. I don't know that I would even call it a double bottom. Maybe if you want to stretch, go out on a limb and do something like that, possibly. Uh, but I would want to see this thin structure retraced on the clearance of, once again, that 685 level. So there's some work to do here out of Netflix. I'd like to see ideally consolidation here, a brigade bolt. That would be nice and respectful. We'll see. Sometimes Netflix tends to have a mind of its own when volatility starts to creep in. And then when volatility dies out and it just does nothing, it becomes painful to trade. So watching that, 685 as a major, major level there in Netflix. Finally, for the core list is AMD. What a rocket ship in the upward direction today. This one probably looked better and, and should have been more so on my radar. And just for full transparency, I've had a really rough, uh, you know, beginning of the week here with no trades on Monday, Tuesday, and a, you know, a loser today. Uh, I honestly stopped out for around one and a half R instead of a respectful stop at just one R. So, not the best performance to begin the week, so I'm really hopeful that some of these setups start to really solidify themselves and, and clarify, but with a little bit of hindsight and reflection here, I think that this is maybe helpful or could help someone out there. AMD was one of the only names opening on a very strong gap up this morning. All of the other names were like a mild gap up or opening inside of range, and we had talked, like I even can go back and look at the pre-market prep where I was saying, hey, maybe a gap fill reversal is interesting. Um, I just sort of like threw in the towel, to be honest with you after the morning loser uh, and, and just sort of like wasn't even watching for the reversal out of that. But regardless, going forward, I think the chart setup is very clear. A pullback off of the 50 SMA, just like the broad market, this is top of mind and then really looking for buying a higher low up against something like 145.25. If you look at the previous structure, previous lows, previous lows, opening print of today's session, this is a brigade bolt in the grand scheme of things from the low, setting a higher low and then looking for continuation to the equal high, if not some sort of swing over time. I'm not saying I would swing trade it, but I'm talking about the ranges to exploit up towards this previous pivot top. And that would come from like the daily time frame chart, right? If we do something that looks like this, it would be approaching the neckline of what could be considered a daily double bottom. So I like AMD. I like what it's starting to suggest. It's going to probably some be somewhat of a top watch for me into the end of the week. And with that, we'll jump into three additional ideas for you, and then we'll sign off for the evening. PYPL is first up on the chopping block PayPal. Here is a flat top daily time frame chart offering multiple hammers back to back to back. Look at the attempts, right? The most important takeaway here is Friday's low. We breach Friday's low on Monday, no close underneath. We breach Friday's low on Tuesday, no close underneath. We breach Friday's low on today's session, no close underneath. Now we've set up two equal highs, multiple hammers back to back to back off of a key level at 68.15. Any sort of break should get at least get a retest of this 71.40 bottom end of the overhead supply. So as I look at the hourly time frame chart, I mean, this is like clearly a higher low double bottom over the neckline gets interesting. So that's the idea here out of PayPal 69.35. After PayPal, we have MMM for 3M, of course. 
And this is a sort of revisiting a previous idea. We had talked about the bull flag from back here in the past. Look at how we made it to target ultimately. I mean, after a very sloppy consolidation back here, but same concept as PayPal, but only with one day of activity. So on Monday, we set up a bearish three bar play, right? If I really zoom in here, Here's Friday's breakdown. We have an inside bar on Monday with two equal lows, meaning that if you were to break these, and we even get an inside bar on, on Tuesday. Jeez, I should throw that in there. It's like a four bar play. So any breakdown underneath these lows should really entice the sellers as you know, looking for continuation. We see that breakdown in the lower wick of today's session, but yet we close at these highs. So it's similar to what we were just looking at out of PayPal, but slightly different. It's also a different sector, of course. It's not a fintech. It's you know very much so a consumer staple, if you will. Over these highs are you know, maybe industrials. I don't know exactly which category or sector it falls into, but you get the idea. It's disjointed from semiconductors. It's not involved in that at all. Over these equal highs, 134 becomes the target. Here it is on the hourly time frame chart. We can draw a neckline in here at, let's just call it at 130.15. And this 130.15 is the neckline of what? Possibly an inverted head and shoulders, and your breakout comes into the origin of this breakdown at 134. So that's MMM in a nutshell. I would not be interested in this trade if we're consolidating and start spending more time underneath 128.50. Final trade idea, also unrelated to the tech sector or any semiconductors, is Walmart. Walmart, a good old American staple right behind McDonald's, of course. What do we see over here? You've got a bullish three bar play. So if the market's ready for a reversal, if the market's ready to move in the upward direction, if we're not going to get this pullback I was talking about in the broad market as a whole, and we do see follow through in the upward direction to accept inside of the overhead balance ranges, this is a great play into all time high territory out of Walmart bullish three bar play upper or sorry, lower wick supportive over the top end of the previous rejections in here. You could call this some sort of bull flag, if you will. If we take it on down to the hourly time frame chart, I like the acceptance over the opening print. I like the fact that it was accepting over this intraday pivot point as well here out of Walmart. So if you wanted a more nuanced level to use as well, you could go off of 7840. As long as we're over 7840, let's dim this thing down. Let's make it da dashed dashed, not dotted. There we go. Um, if we're consolidating here, the play is certainly a top watch. This gets really interesting to blue sky territories. This is still consolidation watch, and this is out of play underneath 77 50. That's going to do it for today's episode of the Midweek Market Update. If you enjoyed today's episode or learned anything new, let me know down below in the comment section or by giving the video a very simple thumbs up. If you're new here, subscribe to the channel. We're live every single morning for the pre-market prep. We do the Saturday video, the Wednesday night video. Hopefully these things are of value to you. I know for me, they're a great exercise in organizing my thoughts and keeping tabs on the narrative of the overall market. We do have PPI tomorrow morning at 8.30, so there will be coffee and donuts up in the penthouse office suites tomorrow morning. We hope to see you there here on the channel. With that said, have a green rest of the trading week, and I will see you in the next one.